This screen that you're looking at right now are all of Ezekiel's prophecies from chapters 1 through 48, and they are divided by the prophecies on the date that they were given. And you are here. You are in this prophecy, and I'm going to be taking this video to share it with you about Ezekiel's prophecy and show you where you are at and what has recently been fulfilled. I'm Brother Nicholas James Vanderlane, and today is the 11th day of the 6th month, August 29, 2021. This video is being broadcasted from the country of Cyprus, and this video is a prophecy update. Ezekiel chapters 1 through 48, the prophecies of Ezekiel are happening. And I'm going to be, again, taking you through that spreadsheet that I just shared with you. So please take notes, pause the video, and get a pen and paper because you're going to need to take notes. You won't understand Ezekiel's end time prophecies unless you watch this entire video as some of the interpretation was exclusively given to me to identify and explain and share with you. Praise be to Yah. Hallelujah. And in this video, I will show you some of the most recent fulfillments of Ezekiel's prophecy. I will also audit his prophecy to see what, what has been fulfilled previously, thousands of years ago, what has been fulfilled recently, and what yet needs to be fulfilled. And that means that I'm going to be doing a deep dive into Ezekiel's second to last prophecy that also contains the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. So seriously, get a pen and some paper, take some notes, and let's go ahead and dig in. So here I am in Ezekiel chapter 12, and this is going to set up for the times that we are in. The presumptuous proverb, and the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the proverb that you have heard in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? Tell them therefore, thus saith Yahweh, Elohim, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say unto them, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. For there shall be no more any vain vision nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. Because there was a lot of false prophets going on in Ezekiel chapter 13. Now verse 25, For I am Yahweh, I will speak, and the word that I will speak shall come to pass, it shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, saith Yahweh Elohim. Again, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, be they of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith Yahweh Elohim. So in this little prophecy, you see the words basically repeated twice, back to back. Now why you might be asking Yahweh to repeat himself, it's because I understand Ezekiel's prophecy is for two different time periods. One part of Ezekiel's prophecy was during his lifetime and shortly thereafter, around 525 B.C. And the second part of Ezekiel's prophecy has to do with the time of the end. If you look at Ezekiel's prophecy, he had no prophecies concerning Messiah Yeshua's first coming. So there was a gap of around 2,500 years in between 525 B.C. 19 and then 1948. So that was a long time regarding his prophecy. So that's why it said that uh, the, his, Yahweh's words aren't going to be prolonged anymore. That's why people, there was a rumor that it was for a time far out. And just like this is repeated twice, Ezekiel is also made the watchman twice. Once in chapter 3 and once in chapter 33, he's made the watchman twice. So here you can see Ezekiel chapter 3, a watchman for Israel is how this is subtitled in the King James Bible. It says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. And then it goes on throughout the prophecy. Also we see here in Ezekiel chapter 33, it's almost identical chapters in identical language. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Israel. So looking at the spreadsheet, you can see the first time he was made the watchman in Ezekiel chapter 3. That was part of this prophecy right here that was given in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. The second time he was made the watchman in Ezekiel chapter 33 
was about seven years later in the 12th year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. He was made the watchman a second time. And the reason why Ezekiel is made a watchman twice is because he was the watchman at his time during the Babylonian siege and destruction of Jerusalem. But also Ezekiel is a type of Messiah Yeshua's end time servant prophet who is the Ezekiel 33 watchman. I've done a video on this. You should check out my video that I have done on this. I'll put a link in the description. Not only was Ezekiel made the watchman twice, but Ezekiel is also called the sign unto the house of Israel twice. And the reason why is because Ezekiel is a type of the end time prophet. Not only was he a sign then, but the end time prophet, more than likely how I understand it, is also going to be a sign. So here you could see in Ezekiel chapter 12, For I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. And then again in verse 11, he, Ezekiel is told to say, I am your sign. We see very similar, again, saying, made, he's made it this sign twice in Ezekiel 24, after his wife dies, in verse 24, verse 24, Thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. And then in verse 27, and thou shalt be a sign unto them. So just as Messiah Yeshua was a sign, he gave him the sign of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. He, Messiah Yeshua prophesied of the sign of Jonah, possibly at the end. Regarding that, there's going to be a prophet at the end. So that word for sign is in Ezekiel is in the Hebrew, it's mofeth. And it means wonder, sign, miracle, portent, a wonder a sign, a token, and also in the Greek, it's uh, semion, and it means a sign, a mark, a token, that by which a person is distinguished, a thing that is distinguished from others and is known, a sign, prodigy, portent. So Ezekiel is the sign. We are looking for that end time servant, that end time Elijah type servant, and we have the Revelation 12 sign, or better to call it a great wonder, because that's what it was called. It was called a great wonder in heaven, and it left us all wondering what the sign meant. Okay, that might be called an oath because it was a sign in the sky, but that sign in the sky signified Elijah, the end time Elijah type prophet, whose Messiah Yeshua is end time servant. Now, I know that a lot of you that might be watching this video are probably lost on this entire concept. You guys think that Elijah is one of the two witnesses. I've identified the two witnesses to be the prophet John, the revelator, and the prophet Daniel. Uh, I have a whole playlist on that. But no, this is speaking of the end time servant, who's Messiah Yeshua's end time servant, because remember, Elijah has to come first. And yes, John the Baptist was an Elijah type, also the end time servant that precedes Messiah Yeshua's arrival is also the end time Elijah type, a forerunner. So again, Ezekiel chapter 12, at the last verse that I read, Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 28, Therefore none of my words shall be prolonged any more, but that word which I have spoken shall be done, saith Yahweh. Now that's coming for many days to come, and that time is now. So there was a big gap. Now this last prophecy was fulfilled shortly after Ezekiel's life in 525 BC when the Persian Empire uh, defeated the Egyptian Empire. So technically the arrow should be from 525 BC all the way up to 1948. Please note that I do not think that the Jewish state of Israel is fulfilled prophecy regarding the regathering and the restoration of the real Israelites. But rather, I will prove in this video that the Jewish state is the fulfillment of prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 35 and 36, specifically the prophecy of Edom taking the land, as I will demonstrate to you in this video. Here are just some of the key events that happened during Ezekiel's life and his prophecy. Year 598 to 597 BC, that's the first year of the captivity of King Jehoiakim. He was captured by Babylon 
and about 3,000 Israelites, Judahites, Levites, Judah, uh, Ezekiel was a Levite, were deported to Babylon. And then in the fifth year of that captivity, Ezekiel received his first vision and word of Yahweh as a prophet. It came to him. And then at 587 to 86 BC, in the 11th year of the captivity, that's when Babylon came back a second time and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And then in 574 to 573 BC, which is the 25th year of the captivity, after the 14th year of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, Ezekiel received his second to last vision and word of Yahweh as a prophet. And then in the 27th year of captivity, he received a prophecy regarding the destruction of Pharaoh by the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon was a term that uh, went to Cyrus after the Persians defeated Babylon. Uh, that was one of his titles. And Cyrus and the, and the Persian Empire defeated Egypt in 525 BC. So that was fulfilled. So about half of the portion of Ezekiel's prophecies were fulfilled during his lifetime as he was prophesying during the 22 years that he received prophecies from 594 BC all the way up to the year 571 BC. So there's some interesting dates in Ezekiel and I think that the dates that are given, some of them are very important. What's interesting is here in Ezekiel chapter 20 to 23, he was given a prophecy against Jerusalem in the seventh year of the captivity on the 10th day of the fifth month. And what, has, what was interesting about that is exactly four years after the prophecy was given, uh, the Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians. And that the 10th day of the fifth month later became the fast of the fifth month. Also what's important is, is that in the ninth year, on the 10th day of the 10th month, it says in the prophecy, the self same day of the prophecy, that the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem started. So that's really interesting because the Babylonian siege started on the self same day. So Ezekiel was given the heads up via the vision that, the, that Jerusalem was gonna be sieged on that day. And that started the siege that led to the Jerusalem and the temple's destruction about a year and a half later. On the 10th day of the fifth month. That's why this fast became the fast of the 10th month. Another important date of a prophecy that was given to Ezekiel is here in his vision that he received in the 25th year of the captivity. This is pertaining to the millennial reign of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. And he received this at the head of the year on the 10th day, which means it was a, if the head of the year being the 10th day means it's a Jubilee year. And it happened 14 years after the destruction of the Jerusalem. So that's when it talks about the millennial reign temple. And so that I believe has a prophetic implication that the millennial reign will specifically the millennial temple will be opened on the 10th day of the seventh month. So on the day of atonement on a Jubilee year. So celebrating the Jubilee and that Yahweh's spirit will come in through the east gate into that temple on the 10th day of the seventh month on a Jubilee year uh, that that will happen in the future. Okay, so here are the prophecies of Ezekiel. Now here's that same page, but with the unfulfilled prophecies here in blue. Everything that you see that is blue and bold is unfulfilled prophecy of Ezekiel. The prophecies here in red have been fulfilled or partially fulfilled, partially fulfilled, partially fulfilled. The prophecies in bold and in black were likely filled, but this prophecy in orange might not yet have been fulfilled or could possibly have a dual fulfillment. I'm uncertain about that. So all these other prophecies that are not bold and are black are prophecies that were already fulfilled during the time of Ezekiel and up to 525 BC, when the Persian Empire defeated the Egyptians. So again, as I said, about half of Ezekiel's prophecy has been fulfilled, and about the other half, it's now being fulfilled as I'm going to be showing you in this video. One major theme of some prophecies that are unfulfilled 
are the unfulfilled promises of restoration of real Israel. During the period of Ezekiel's prophecy, he was given on eight different occasions, eight prophecies pertaining to the real restoration and regathering or gathering of the real Israelites. In Ezekiel chapter 11, Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter 20, Ezekiel chapter 28, Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 37, and Ezekiel chapter 39. And when you read these prophecies regarding the promise of restoration, regarding the regathering, none of these prophecies were fulfilled by the modern Jewish Edomite state of Israel. It's completely different. But your Bible teachers, your Bible, your prophecy teachers have been indoctrinated with lies and they cannot think for themselves. They have no critical thinking and cannot recognize that these prophecies have yet to be fulfilled. Again, Ezekiel chapter 11, a promise of restoration. Ezekiel chapter 16, the covenant remembered. Ezekiel chapter 20, judgment and restoration. Ezekiel chapter 28, the restoration of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 34, the good shepherd. Ezekiel chapter 34, the covenant of peace. Ezekiel chapter 36, a new heart and spirit. Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel chapter 37, the vision explained. Ezekiel chapter 37, one nation with one king. Ezekiel chapter 39, Israel to be restored. None of these prophecies that I share with you have been fulfilled by the modern Jewish state of Israel. Yet, yet the supermajority of modern Christianity all believe that the modern Jewish state is fulfilled biblical prophecy of Israel being restored to the land. And as I said, if you read those chapters and use just a little bit of critical thinking, you can see for yourself that they are not. But rather, they are the fulfillment of Ezekiel 35 and 36, which I will now share which is the fulfillment of Edom and the residue of the heathen are in the land. Here's a prophecy against Mount Seir. And Mount Seir was in the territory of Edom. So this is pertaining to the Edomites. And one key verse that I want you to key on in this chapter is because thou hast said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine and we will possess it. Whereas Yahweh was there as if Yahweh was there. So there is going to be a group of people, Edomites, that are going to possess the land, the two countries, and they're going to possess the countries as if they are practicing and worshiping Yahweh. So the Edomites will be practicing a religion, and it just so happens that King Herod, he was an Edomite that converted to Judaism. So it's no... It's no wonder that in the Jewish encyclopedia they said that Edomites is Judaism. So what two countries are they talking about? They're talking about possessing the land. Possessing the land of Judah, which is the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel. And that happened in May 14, 1948, as I will be explaining to you. Also, in the next chapter of Ezekiel, chapter 36, Also thou, son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, because thy enemy has said against you, this is to the mountains of Israel, Aha! Even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith Yahweh, because they have made you desolate and have swallowed you up on every side, that ye may be a possession unto the residue of the heathen, and ye are taken up in the lips of talkers, and are the infamy of the people. Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of Yahweh Elohim. Thus saith Yahweh Elohim to the mountains, and to the hills, and to the rivers, and to the valleys, to the desolate wastes, and to the cities that are forsaken, which became a prey in derision, to the residue of the heathen that are round about, Therefore, thus saith Yahweh Elohim, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumia, Idumia is Edom, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, 
to cast it out for a prey. So these two prophecies of Ezekiel 36 verse 2 and Ezekiel 36 verse 5, I'm now going to demonstrate to you the fulfillment of these two prophecies. So what you're looking at is a copy of the Balfour Declaration. The letter was dated November 2nd, 1917, and it was written by James Balfour, who was the Foreign Secretary of Great Britain. He sent a letter to Lord Rothschild, the Rothschild banking family, who are Jewish. And he says, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine, which is a land of a national home for the Jewish people. So what this letter is, it's a letter from Great Britain to Lord Rothschild, so a representative of the Jewish people, the Zionist movement, for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for a Jewish people. Basically, they're saying that you have right to some of this land to form your Jewish state. But what was interesting is, is that this letter was written on November 2nd. Again, the prophecy is, in Ezekiel 36, verse 5, Therefore thus saith Yahweh Elohim, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Edomia, which have appointed my land into their possession with joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds to cast it out for a prey. Now, this letter, I don't believe, is the fulfillment of this verse, as I will show you what is coming up. So again, I do not think that this letter is the fulfillment of this prophecy, but I believe that this letter is the first stage of the fulfillment of this prophecy, that this prophecy was later fulfilled on May 14, 1948. The reason is, is because when I was examining this letter and the date of this letter, and the, what was actually going on at the time that this letter was written, something very strange appeared to me. So this screenshot of this video is by the channel called Balfour 100. They only have one video, and it was a documentary or a quick interview with the modern Jacob Rothschild regarding the Balfour Declaration for its come, upcoming 100-year anniversary. And in this video, this guy is interviewing Jacob Rothschild regarding the history of the Balfour Declaration and how this all kicked off. And in this video, you guys should watch this video. It's only 16 minutes long. But he gives an account of a guy named Heim Weitzman, who was a Zionist scientist that came into England and persuaded the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary, the Foreign Minister, and got to familiar with his family and did an um, unbelievable job of persuading all of these people to grant the land to the Jewish people. But the problem is, is that the story really is unbelievable. And that's where you get the word his story from, history or his story, because that is his story that he made up to deflect the fact that more than likely that there was a deal behind the curtains between the Rothschilds and Great Britain. Because what struck out to me was, was that the Belfort Declaration was written in the middle of the war that was going on in Palestine between the British and the Ottoman Empire. Because the Balfour Declaration, that letter and promise of that land, as you know, it was dated on November 2nd, 1917, and that was actually in the middle of the Ottoman Empire conflict. So that war between Great Britain and France versus the Ottoman Empire, it started in March and April of 1917. It didn't end until the Battle of Megiddo in September 1918. So in that video, Rothschild's explanation really is unbelievable because as you can see, the letter happened on November 2nd, 2019 in the middle of the war that the land of Israel was promised for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. So you can't believe what Rothschild is saying. There was deeper things going on here than the history, his story, that he's giving everybody. 
And what's even more crazy that proves that story regarding the Balfour Declaration as a lie is that the Battle of Jerusalem, the most important battle probably in that whole conflict, it didn't even start until after the Balfour Declaration was sent. So the Balfour Declaration was written on November 2nd of 1917. The Battle for Jerusalem for the city developed from the 17th of November of 1917 and it continued until the surrender of December 30th 1917 and General Allenby he entered Jerusalem on foot on the 11th of December of 1917 so they hadn't even won Jerusalem yet let alone other battles yet they were already promising the land to the Rothschilds for the Jewish people so that story regarding Heim Weitzman is a complete fabrication and a lie. It's his story, but we know that a deal had to been made between the Rothschilds and the British government, and maybe even, and more than likely, the British royal family, which would have been the king at that time. So after Great Britain and France defeated the Ottoman Empire, they developed what's called the British Mandate and the French Mandate. The French got like Lebanon and Syria, and the British Mandate was for Palestine and Transjordan. So that became so this so that they became under the British Mandate. And the British Mandate means that they basically occupied Palestine from 1918 until the mandate expired in 1948 and they removed their forces and withdraw their forces so there was a 30-year period here where the british had control that's the union jack flag right here the union jacob flag had control of this territory but that territory was already promised out in a deal that happened during the war so now you might be asking, what is the fulfillment of that verse? Ezekiel 36, verse 5. What do you have, Nick? And what I have for you is the Israeli Declaration of Independence. Here's a screenshot of Wikipedia. And as you can see in Wikipedia, it declared the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz, Israel. Eretz means land of. So it's the land of Israel to be known as the State of Israel, which would come into effect on termination of the British Mandate at midnight on May 14, 1948. So again, Eretz Israel, which means the land of Israel, is synonymous with, quote, my land, right here in this verse, per, per Ezekiel 36, verse 5. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh Elohim, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Edomia, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. Now remember, when they got this land, they only got a little bit of it, and then a war happened right away, and then another war happened, and another war happened, and they've been they've been casting it out for a prey ever since they made this declaration. Yes, they've been attacked, but also they've been casting it out for prey. As I just shared, that the declaration of the independence of the Jewish state of Israel is the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, verse 5. They've appointed Edomia and the heathen, who you see in this picture, these are the relatives of Edomia and the heathen. They have appointed uh, Yahweh's land into their possession and they did that in their declaration of independence. Now let me go ahead and share with you that inside of their declaration of independence. Here I am at their government page regarding their declaration of independence that they have posted in English online and as you can see remember they pointed my land and my land is Eretz Israel. And as you can see, it's right here in bold. It says Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And as you're going to see, a common theme throughout this document is the land, the land, the land. Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. 
And then they say that they, these people say that they were forcibly exiled from their land. Some of these people might have been because they were the residue of the heathen at the time that the Romans came in there and moved everybody out. Remember, King Herod was an Edomite who converted to Judaism. And then after him, his sons took over and ruled as well. And those were Edomites that were more than likely uh, under Judaism as well. So there was probably a plethora of Jewish Edomites in the land up to the time of the Romans. Now, they might have been in good standing with the Romans, but considering the fact that they were called Jewish at that time, 70 years removed, things might have been a little bit different. I don't have the full uh, history on that. So saying that they were exiled from their land, they're exiled from their homes. They weren't exiled from their land because the land always belonged to Israel and they were Edomites and the heathen. To reestablish themselves in their ancient homeland. Homeland, they're talking about the land. And that is, again, is the constant theme in this document. It's all about the land. Eretz. It talks about how the first Zionist Congress convened and proclaimed the right of the Jewish people to national birth in its own country. So in its own land. And how Eretz Israel, right here, I didn't have that highlighted, um, the connection between the Jewish people of Eretz Israel to rebuild its national home by reestablishing in Eretz Israel the homeland, in their national homeland, in Eretz Israel, in their own sovereign state. And then they declared the establishment, by declaring establishment, they're appointing this land, okay, in Eretz Israel just as I shared in the previous prophecy. So in this section here that you see that's bold, this is the really important part here because this is where they are appointing the land. And as you see, I missed it again. It says Eretz right here, Eretz Israel. Then also it says Eretz Israel here. So I missed it. And then it says Eretz Israel here. But when they declared the establishment, by declaring the establishment, what they're doing in this document is that they're appointing this land to their people. They're tying the people in the land together. They're appointing Yahweh's land to themselves, which is the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36 verse 5. And it's a totally hypocritical document because they're saying that they're going to do it as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. They should have said, as envisioned by Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 5, because this is the fulfillment of it. Okay, the whole of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, in its own land, Eretz Israel, on the soil of the homeland. So this whole document, their whole declaration of independence, as you can see, the primary port, one of the main themes, is about the land of Israel. And that's what happened on May 14th, 1948. That verse was not that a nation can be born in a day verse of Isaiah chapter 66. That verse is speaking of the rapture. But Christians, but most Christians, they're too, they're too ignorant to actually read. They're too lazy to actually read that chapter and do some critical thinking of Isaiah chapter 66 and see that that verse is pertaining to the rapture resurrection event, that a nation can be born at once. That's not speaking to this event. Ezekiel chapter 36, 5 is speaking to this event. What I just demonstrated to you in the Declaration, in, in the Jewish state's Declaration of Independence, is that that was the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36, verse 5. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh Elohim, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumia which have appointed my land into their possession with joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds to cast it out for a prey. So who is, why Edomia? Well, don't you know, King Herod, he was an Edomite and he converted to Judaism. And so when the, when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple in 70 uh, uh, CE and destroyed the temple and deported some of the real Judahites, and some of the real remnant Israelites out. He also, the Roman Empire deported out the residue, some of the residue of the heathen, and also Idumia. Who were identifying as Jewish. 
or Judaism. They went in there and they just wrecked house. So when you read the Israeli Declaration of Independence, there's a half truth saying that they got kicked out of the land, but they really did, but they're not, but they're claiming to be a people group that they're not. None of these people are biologically related through their same fathers. The Jewish religion is all about their lineage through their mothers, which is unbiblical. So these, so this is the prophecy fulfilled of Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 5. A couple things important to note for my next video. This, that the location of this event, of the Declaration of Independence for the State, happened in the city of Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv means Young Mountain or Spring Mountain, Spring Hill. And there was never a Tel Aviv in Biblical Israel. But the name was given to the Jewish state's first capital. And the etymology in origin comes from Ezekiel's first prophecy of chapters 1 through 7. In Ezekiel chapter 315, it talks about Tel Aviv. And you can read about this. And you could read that the Tel Aviv started in 1909 as a small settlement on the sand dunes north of Jaffa, Tel Aviv. Now, remember what Messiah Yeshua said about building your house. You don't want to build your house on sand. Uh, because when the strong waves come, it's going to pound. You've got to build it on the rock. So now that I showed you the fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 5 in the Declaration of Independence of the Monastery of Israel, let me show you where Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 2 was fulfilled. And it was fulfilled in the de facto annexation of the Golan Heights. On December 14, 1981, Israel passed the Golan Heights Law that extended Israeli law's jurisdiction and administration to the Golan Heights area, right here. Although the law effectively annexed the territory to Israel, it did not explicitly spell out a formal annexation. The Golan Heights law is not recognized internationally except as of March 2019 by the United States when Trump recognized the Golan Heights. So now let me go ahead and share with you Ezekiel chapter 36. So what you guys need to know is it's called the Golan Heights for the reason. These are called the mountains of Israel. It even has a part of Mount Hermon, which is going to be the highest elevation in all of Israel. And it says in Ezekiel 36 verse 2, Aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. And what part is the ancient high places? Right here is the ancient high places. Damascus is the oldest continuous habitable city on the earth. So these are the ancient high places. And there's some really ancient high places up here. There's like a stone monument up here. There's a bunch of stone monuments up here in this area. And here's one of the ancient high places that I talked about. It's called Rujum. Al-Hiri and Rujum Al-Hiri is an ancient megalith monument consisting of concentric circles of stone with a tumulus at center. It is located in the Israeli occupied portion of the Golan Heights, Syria, some 16 kilometers east of the coast of the Sea of Galilee, in the middle of a large plateau covered with hundreds of dolomes. So a plateau is a high place. Okay, and there is all of these old dolomes uh, that are these stone dolomes that are in this plateau with this megalith monument here. This is what's called an ancient high place because a plateau is an elevated location, and that's what this is it's an elevated location. So, this is it, and this is the location of the monument. And Rujim Alhiri is right here inside of the Golan Heights. So that when they said, aha, even the ancient high places are ours, that's what that verse is talking about. It's talking about Edomite Jewish Israel taking the Golan Heights and occupying it. And, and don't forget, Mount Hermon is right here. And that's also part of Edomite Israel. Remember, Mount Hermon that's where the fallen angels descended upon Mount Hermon. And that story goes all the way back to pre-flood. So that's a really old place. And they're saying, aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. And these are them. These are the ancient high places. And that was fulfilled, whether you want to call it December 14th, 1981, or in March 2019, it's been fulfilled. They, they're calling this theirs. 
So what I just shared with you, a prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 35 and two prophecies in Ezekiel 36, the prophecies to the mountains of Israel were fulfilled. Another prophecy that was recently fulfilled two years ago was the fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 24. And as you can see, this is in that same prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 21, all the way through th the end of the Gog Magog War of Ezekiel 39, verse 29. It's the explanation of the land's fall. I've already done like four videos on this prophecy. Here are two of them. This is the first video I did, and here's another one I did regarding the same prophecy. This one was 19 minutes, and then I expounded upon that video here for 42 minutes. I recommend that everybody watch this video. I will leave a link for this video in the description. For time's sake of this video that you're watching, this one's already long enough, but you need to watch this fulfilled. Anybody watching Prophecy should be watching that video. Yahweh gave me the insight to identify uh, the fulfillment of this prophecy when the ambassador of Israel to the United Nations tried to use the Abraham covenant to claim right to Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel. And I explained that. So I explained it in one year. I explained it in the following year which was last year, and now uh, I'm going to explain it again. So here is Ezekiel chapter 33. And note that they call it ex Explanation of Jerusalem's Fall, but the real title should be, it's the wrong title. The real title should be the Explanation of the Land's Fall. Because look at all the times it talks about the land, the land, the land, the land. It's all throughout here. So I will get back to this prophecy. Uh, maybe I'll play this video at the end of this clip or maybe at least leave a link to it. But this video, it has not a lot of views compared to how significant it is considering it literally is verbatim, word for word. He ver word for word fulfills Ezekiel chapter 33, 24. You can't get a more precisely filled, almost a precisely filled prophecy. Well, actually all prophecy is precisely filled. But this is just, it was something to, to see, and it just hasn't got a lot of traction. But maybe you'll get some traction now that you're watching this video. So all three of those prophecies, Ezekiel 33, verse 24, Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 10, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 2, and 36, verse 5, are all part of this prophecy that you see outlined in blue. And that is Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 21 through the end of chapter 39, Ezekiel 39, 29. That prophecy was given on the fifth day of the 10th month in the 12th year of the captivity. We are inside of this prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 21, through Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 29. So let's take a look at all the different sections of this prophecy to understand what's going to be playing out. Ezekiel chapter 33, which is the explanation of the land's fall, not Jerusalem's fall, but the land's fall. You have Ezekiel chapter 34, prophecy against Israel's shepherds. You have the prophecy of the good shepherd. You have the covenant of peace that's going to be made with the Israelites after they've been restored. You have Ezekiel 35, which is the prophecy against Mount Seir, which is against the Edomites. In Ezekiel 36, you have the prophecy to the mountains of Israel, but this is against all Udemia, which are the Edomite Jewish people in the land right now, and also against the heathen Jewish people in the land right now. Which I already have explained that prophecy to you. And also you have Yahweh's holy name, uh, which he's, he's going to do. He's, doing, he's going to restore their true Israelites for his holy name's sake. Hallelujah. And then it talks about a new heart and spirit to the Israelites. Okay, of Ezekiel chapter 36. This did not happen with this modern country that with this modern country that they want to claim to be Israel and Israelites. They're not. It's a Jewish state, not an Israelite state. Okay, you got to understand that that is a legal document and that information, that words matter. And it's a Jewish state, not an Israelite state. You're Jewish by your mother. You're not Jewish by your father's Y DNA haplogroup that he passed down to you. 
You are Israelite by your father's Y-DNA haplogroup. Now, I want to be clear and fair. I do believe that possibly up to 10% of the male population could be true blood male Israelites. I can't say for certain because I don't know how, I don't know which Y haplogroup is which, but there is a possibility that just about 10% of them are, could be blood Israelites that are under the false assumption that they are Jewish. Okay. Then Ezekiel chapter 37, you have the Valley of Dry Bones, okay, which is also the, re, which is, uh, the regathering of Israel. You have the vision explained. And then you have one nation and one king. This is the two sticks becoming one, and there's going to be the king, the servant David type. Then once, we're, once they're regathered in their land, that's when Ezekiel 38 is going to happen, and that's when Ezekiel 39 is going to happen. And then at the end, Israel is to be restored in the day that Yahweh does this. So you might be wondering, well, Nick, how's Ezekiel 38 and 39 is going to play out if those aren't the real Israelites? Well, that's where Ezekiel 7 possibly comes into play because this, I, this prophecy might be fulfilled again or it might be fulfilled on its own. And this is regarding the, uh, the hour of doom and the destruction on the land of Israel, Eretz Israel. Here you could see this prophecy is about the land of Israel. O thou that dwellest in the land, the land, the people of the land. It's not talking about the Israelites. It's talking about the people in the land. O thou that dwellest in the land. This is, does not appear to be a judgment about the Israelites, possibly. It could have been pertaining to the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon, but it also could have a dual fulfillment, possibly. This might be one of the prophecies that does. And evil is, and only evil, behold, is come. Is The end is come. The end is come. And watch it for thee, but behold, it is come. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land. The time is come. The day of trouble is near. And then keep going down. Behold, the day, behold, it is come. And then the time is come. The day draweth near. And then they have blown the trumpet, Yom Teruah, possibly, even to make ready, but none go without the battle, for my wrath is upon the multitude thereof. The sword is without, and the pestilence and famine with, are within. He that is in, in the field shall die by the sword. And then it comes down to here. And it talks about this at the end. Make a chain, for the land is full of bloody crimes, and the city is full of violence. And that's actually what goes on in Israel. Okay? Destruction cometh, and they seek peace, you know, that Abraham accord, and there shall be none, he says, okay? Mischief upon mischief, rumor upon rumor, they shall seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. The king shall mourn, the prince shall be clothed with the desolation, and the hands of the people of the land, the Eretz, shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their way, according to their deserts, will I judge them, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. So I think that judgment's going to be coming on that land. A huge list of bloody crimes that they've committed. I guess time will tell. So again, that prophecy that I just shared with you was right here of the hour of doom and the desolation of the land. And that prophecy is connected to Tel Aviv in chapter 3, verse 15. So I hope, I hope, that, you, I hope that you're blessed by the information in this video. You are here. We are in this prophecy of Ezekiel. We are in it. We've seen prophecies fulfilled. And now we're waiting for Yahweh. For his own namesake. To remember his promises that he made to his people and to restore the real Israelites and bring them into their land, into the wilderness of Israel, which is probably possibly the 1,260 days. And then after they're brought into the land, that's when the Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Messiah Yeshua is going to miraculously come back and save the Israelites. And then we have the millennial reign with King Messiah Yeshua here on earth, dwelling in the land. So brothers and sisters, I'm signing off and I hope that you're blessed. And take a look out for my next video. If you haven't hit the bell, you should. And I'm signing off and shalom to all my brothers and sisters out there who have the testimony of Messiah Yeshua and guard his commandments Shalom to you, brothers and sisters. I hope that you're blessed.
on the screen there should be a link to the Ezekiel 33 verse 24 prophecy fulfilled. You please watch this video. Also you can take notes if you want, but this is very important to identify this. Again, I hope that you're blessed by that video too.